So today we're going to talk about page rank. So page rank is an algorithm to rank the pages in the internet. This is one of the was or was at least one of the ingredients of Google in the, the search engine, and really what what helped revolutionize the, the way that uh, that Google was able to answer queries for pages. So if we think about what you know what a search engine needs to do, so I think you go online, you want to you want to know something about uh, fridges. You write fridge, all right, uh, fridges and. Uh, the, the program on the other side needs to know what pages to show you about fridges. So in order for, for, such a, for such a program to be able to do this, for say Google or another search engine, what they have to do is the following. First of all, they have to get to know the internet. Right? They have to go and look at the internet to see what pages exist. So one thing that, uh, the, that one way this can be done is with web crawlers. So basically, these are think of them as computers that just automatically crawl the internet, just follow links blindly and store information about what they're seeing. Right. So this way, they get information about the internet. Then, of course, it needs to find a good way of storing this information, very very well indexed, so that when I search fridges, I go and I see, uh, you know. The search engine can see, okay, all these pages talk about fridges. I should pick a few of these. But an important ingredient, and that's the one we're going to talk about, is now maybe many pages talk about fridges, right? And if many pages talk about fridges, how does how does the search engine tell you which one to pick first, right? How does the search engine order them? And one way that it can do this is by rating the importance of the website. Now, of course, you know, search engines. Uh, work a little differently, they know a bit about you when you go online, and so they use things they know about you to give pages that are personalized to you. So we're talking about sort of the version in which this doesn't happen. Although if you are able to you know, compute or estimate the importance of a page, you can still use it as a subroutine for, for things that, for the type of things even now that have personalization, and indeed these things are used as subroutines. Right, so what the goal here is to, you know, the goal, is to compute or estimate, you know, compute some form of importance, importance of a web page. Right, and so we want to compute some type of score. Right? We can think of it as an importance. We can think of it as a score. So this is the goal. So the question is, how do we do this? So of course, there's many heuristics one can take to do this, right? You can say, well, if a website belongs to I don't know, some some official uh, organization or government agency, then it's probably important. You know, you can even do things more, even more heuristic. Like if the URL is very small, then probably this is a serious thing. You know, if the URL is really big, probably not as much, right? You can come up with all sorts of heuristics. How, how well does, how good does the, is the formatting on the page and all sorts of things, right? But the key idea of page rank is to sort of ignore all of this and, and, and focus on, on giving a score of importance based solely on the, on the sort of structure of the internet, on which pages link to which pages. The idea being that a page, so a web page, okay, is important if many pages have hyperlinks to links to okay. Okay, so the idea being that if you have a lot of hyper, if you have a page and you have a lot of links to it, then you you are important, right? And so now the question is, how do we turn this intuition into an algorithm? How do we actually compute importance? But this is sort of the key idea of page rank, right? Is to ignore all the other things about pages and just focus on sort of the topology of the internet, right? And so let's let's give sort of a toy example of the internet. So toy example. Of web, right? Of the web, yeah. right? So, yeah. I have one that's in the lecture notes. Three, four. And now the links are. Right. 
three, three goes to one, one goes to two, two goes to four. Okay, so here is the internet, right? So we, we put a connection, right? I to J if I has an hyperlink, is an hyperlink to J. And moreover, we call this it's a backlink of J. Right? So we have this type of structure. Now the goal is to come up with a good score. Right? So again, the same goal, right? Compute some type of score. Compute score for each page. Right? And we're going to call this xk. Right? And we want xk to be non negative. And we want xk to be exactly the score. Of page K. Okay. Now, of course, you know, there's many things one can do, right? So let's start with some attempts and then we'll see why these attempts don't, don't quite uh, work so well, right? So let's make attempts. Right. Attempt number one. Right? Give a uh, you know, set uh, uh, make the, the importance of the page xk equals to the number of backlinks Okay, right? One could do this. We go look at, uh, you know, we go look at the pages and we see, well, how many backlinks does each one have? And then we use that as the score of the page, right? So, I mean, let's do this exercise, right? So, in this little example of the internet, right, x1 would have two backlinks, x2 would have only one backlink, x3 would have uh, one, two, three backlinks, and x4 would have two backlinks as well. Okay, so this could be a reasonable way of doing this. Of course, this would have issues from the viewpoint of the search engine because then it would mean that you know you could just if you want your page to show up higher in the search link you just create many many pages around linking to you right but in fact even even the sort of better algorithm we're going to find will still have issues of this type and there, and there is sort of a, you know, a business of trying to 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 model to like massage the internet to get your page to show up higher and all this and, and sort of the search engines are always trying to change their algorithms a bit so that this, this, these things don't work and so on, but this is not what this lecture is about. I, one, one issue, even without talking about sort of the, the adversarial setup of trying to gain the system, we here already have an issue, which is even in this toy example, right, we have here two pages that have the same, uh, have the same score, right? Page one and page four, right? Because each of them has two links. I would argue, however, that page four is less important than page one. Why? Because the most important page in this little internet is page three, right? As a score of three in this case, right? And it looks important, there's lots of links to it. And page one gets a link from three. While page four, the link it gets is from two, which seems very unimportant, right? So the issue is that, you know, the strength of the, of, the, of the score that you get from a page linking to you should depend on the importance that links to you, right? So receiving, receiving a link from an important page should give you, should give a page higher score than from an unimportant page. Right, it's reasonable, right? You want to get, you want to evaluate, you want to score better links that come from important pages. Right, so let's try, let's try another attempt that satisfies this. 
Okay. I will leave the little internet and we'll make attempt number two. That's the little graph, so I have to draw it again. Let's see. Okay, a tip number two. A very natural thing would be to say, well, let's get, let's instead simply make the score the sum of the scores. Right? So let's get some notation. Right? So let's say LK is the set, is the set of pages that link. To K. Right. Okay, so a very natural thing would be, right, the tenth number two would be make, you know, make XK just be the sum of scores that link to K. All right, so now that we have very nice notation, we can just write xk equals sum for all, say, j in the set of x. Okay, so this could be, of course, another, another thing, right? At least it solves this issue of, uh, of having, uh, you know, it solves this issue of, of not or, or it has the feature, the good feature that important pages contribute more to you. Now, why, why does this have a problem? Well, okay, there's sort of one apparent issue is that this is very cyclical, right? I mean, this is a very cyclical definition. It turns out that by itself is not really an issue, right? If you think about it, uh, in fact, page rank will use the spectrum of a matrix and eigenvalues and eigenvectors show up and is exactly because of the cyclicity. Right, if you think about an eigenvalue, eigenvector calculation or equation, right, it's exactly of this type where, say, some matrix M times X is equal to lambda X. Right, it's exactly your X being some type of linear combination of the X's, right? So, so this looks very much similar, right? So exactly this sort of simplicity of the definition is what's going to bring eigenvalues and eigenvectors into play. Now, what's the issue here? Right? There's a few ways of thinking about this, right? If you think of this as a dynamic process, which here it isn't, right? It's just an equation. And you can say that as you compute the scores of other functions, of other, of new pages, they're just going to get higher and higher, right? Because the scores are already high and the pages link to them and so on and so forth, right? And so in particular, you can think, right? Like a mathematician, think of the extreme. Right, think of the page that's the most important. I right? think of the most important page. The most important page cannot possibly contribute its importance to any other page because otherwise, the other page, as long as it had even another page connected to it, right, take let K, let K be the most, the most important page, right. K either doesn't connect to anything, which sort of would be very strange, right? It's like the most important page is the end of the internet, or K contributes to, has a link to something. But if it has a link to something, let's say, you know, L, then this L is already getting the same score from K, so they cannot possibly get a link from anywhere else, right? The same thing for L, and so you have a path, right? This path eventually has to end. Right? Or you have sort of an infinite uh, internet, also not the case. And so this page C would in particular be also the most important, right? And it would be the end of the internet. Right? It's like, it doesn't make much sense, right? You don't want the, you know, as you, as you surf the internet, the most important page is not, is not 
it's not the end of it. And another way to see it is as soon as you have a cycle and something connecting to the cycle, you very quickly see that you get into a that you get into an issue, right? You get into a contradiction. Right? So issue. I mean, very most important page is in the internet. Now, what else are the possible attempts? So, what another thing you could do? So, someone in the lecture uh, suggested this this that this very nice suggestion that you could take the average of the scores. All right. So, the average of the scores maybe doesn't have this issue. Right. At least this contradiction doesn't uh, doesn't show up. Now, what's the issue with the average of the scores? Is that you know if you're a page and you have all these links to you and you have a certain score, you don't want that if an, if just a new page is born very unimportant, let's say, but still a new page is born and links to you, it doesn't make sense that your score got, got lower just because someone linked to you, right? And so for this reason, if you take the average, the average would have this feature, right? That if something less important shows up and connects to you, your score would go down, right? So this, this wouldn't make sense. And so that's why that's what the issue is with the average. So what's one way to try to remedy this? And the way to try to remedy this is to say, well, whenever I'm contributing importance to a page, I cannot just give you know, my full score of, of importance to everyone. I'm going to distribute it amongst everyone. So if I have importance xk and I connect to, say, three pages, I give xk th over three importance to all the pages. Right? So what do I mean by this? Let's say take a node i, so give a node. Right, so given an OJ, define NJ as the number of hyperlinks in HJ. Right? And now the idea is that instead of, of if, uh, if an hyperlink in J, instead of contributing score XJ, it contributes score XJ over NJ. Right? So the page Rank equation, right? Let's say the equation. It's given by, and I'll do this in another color. Right? The importance of xk is equal to the sum over all nodes that uh, that can there are that on which it has backlinks that connect to it. This was our notation, just one over nj times x uh, j. Okay, so this is sort of the equation. Now, right, so now you compute the xk's. Now, of course, this is still cyclic, right? I still need ones to compute the others, but it's very much like an eigenvalue eigenvector calculation. Also, I need to convince you that a solution to this exists, right, which I have not done yet, right? But this I can now write as a, in terms of linear algebra. Right, I just define my matrix B. Okay, so in the lecture I call this A, but I decided to switch it now to B. You'll be clear later. So sorry about the different segmentation. Right, what are these? These are right. This is a matrix in X by C row like rows k and columns j, and it receives a zero if there is no number, and it receives a one over nj if there is a, if there is a link. Right, zero uh, because, right, because the page, uh, so here it has a zero because page one doesn't connect to itself, but, since page one connects to everyone else, it gives a third of its importance to everyone else. Okay, and now with this matrix, all we have really, the page rank equation is just x equals bx. And now we just have to solve this equation. But this is an eigenvalue eigenvector equation, right? So I need to convince you now that B as an eigenvalue equals to 1. 
right? So I'm going to say, I'm going to write theorem P, right? And in fact, any matrix that's non negative and whose columns sum to one, right? It's called column stochastic, has an eigenvalue. One. Moreover, write everything here. Eigenvalue one and it's uh, it is its largest in say an absolute value or or the real one that's largest it, it, it doesn't matter this will all be the same okay okay so how do we show that there's two things I need to show. I need to show that B has an eigenvalue one, and I need to show that it's the largest one. Okay, and all of this is in the, the, in the lecture notes, uh, you know, done with a lot more detail. Yeah, I guess now I deleted the small internet. We still have it here, okay. So why does B have an eigenvalue of one? Well, it's not quite obvious, right? But we're going to hear the proof of this is the following, right? So B and B transpose have the same eigenvalues. There's a few ways of seeing this. You can see it by, by the, the characteristic polynomial, for example. Right, the B and B transpose have the same eigenvalues, but not necessarily eigenvalues, eigenvectors. Right, that's important to know. Right, not necessarily eigenvectors, but they do have the same eigenvalues. Now we're going to show that one is an eigenvalue of B transpose. What's one way to do this? We simply exhibit an eigenvector. Right, so let let one. Right, be a vector in our n. Actually, because later one is going to be a characteristic, uh, you know, the indicator function. Let me call it e. Right, so e is a vector in our n, where e is just the whole lens vector. Right, the vector whose entries are all one. Okay, so e is a whole lens vector. Now I claim that you know, b transpose e is equal to e. Why? Just think about what B transpose is doing, right? Take B transpose. Then what is B transpose times the whole one's vector? It's literally just summing up the, the rows of B transpose. But it's the same thing as summing up the columns of B. Right? And the columns of B, by definition, they all sum to one. Right? Because you get the number of terms you have are nj, and you have one over nj in all of them. Right? So this is correct. So one is an eigenvalue of B, right, of B transpose, and thus of B. Okay, now I told you further that it was the largest one, right? So how do we do that? So this we do with something called the Gershkorn circle theorem, right? So what does the Gershkorn circle theorem say? It's a nice theorem to, to basically, you know, quantitatively, uh, argue the following. So let me let me write that. So so for the rest of the proof, to argue that it's actually just one, we use Gershwin and circle here. It's simple to prove, and I'm not going to do it here. Circle or this theorem. Okay. So what's first? I'm going to say what it is intuitively, right? And then I can write it. It says that right. So it's okay. So before Gershwin circle theorem, we have we have a simple statement, which is let's say we have a matrix D diagonal. Right? And its eigenvalues are simply the entries of the diagonal matrix. Right? This we know. Taking eigenvalues of diagonal matrix is quite simple. Or simply the diagonal elements. Okay, 
Gershwin circle theorem is a way to quantify how much this is still true, even if it's not diagonal, right? So Gershwin circle theorem says, my Gershwin circle theorem says that if a matrix, say, M is almost diagonal, Then, uh, then, well, the eigenvalues are almost uh, the, the diagonal elements. Then the eigenvalues, the lambdas, right? The eigenvalues are almost the diagonal. No. In fact, they're going to be in disk centered at diagonal entries and with certain sort of error or margin. Right? So, so let's see what uh, you can get. I'm going to leave this here for now because it has the matrix in the theorem. Uh, okay. Okay, we're going to have a matrix M. Okay, so Gershwin and so on. Now I'm going to state the actual theorem, but what's important, right, is that it quantifies the effect that if a matrix is almost diagonal, then the eigenvalues are almost in the in the in the same, in the, the diagonal elements. And here we'll say, you know, that because these entries aren't so big, the diagon the, the eigenvalues will not be that far from zero, and in fact will be smaller than one, right? That's what we're going to show. In fact, what it says is, you know, if you have a matrix one. You can call the entries alpha one two, right? Alpha one, alpha two two, alpha two one. You know, so my alpha n n. It says the following: every every right, every lambda eigenvalue uh, of m lies in a Dirch Gordon circle. Right? Of center where, where the Gersh Gordon circles will be things of center with centers alpha kk and radius uh, the sum of the off diagonal entries. So i not k alpha k i. Um, that's the value, right? Another way of saying this. Is every lambda eigenvalue of n, right? For every lambda eigenvalue of n, there exists k such that you know the eigenvalue needs to be close to the diagonal element in the sense that its difference can be at most the sum of the diagonals. Okay. Let me make a separation between these. Okay. So for every lambda, for every lambda eigenvalue of m, there must exist a case such that this holds. Right? I mean, I can rewrite this as for every, right? For every lambda eigenvalue of m, right? There exists a case such that this is satisfied. Now let's use it on the matrix B. Okay. So let's use the Schrodinger circle theorem on matrix B. Or in fact, let's use it on B transpose, but get the same, right? So we're going to use the Schrodinger circle theorem on B transpose, right? So what we know is if you know if lambda is an eigenvalue of B transpose, right? Then okay, then what does it mean? It means that there exists a K such that right? Let's see. Such that lambda minus bkk, well, transpose, but you know, transpose doesn't change at the diagonal matrix, but let's keep it here for now. So j not equal to k, right? B transpose entry uh, in that, I mean, 
the second bit, AJ, right? And the absolute value. Mm -hmm. Right, so this is the KJ entry of B transpose. Right, so this is what Gershwin says. But now what do we know? BKK is zero, so what do we get? Or BKK might not be zero, actually, in general, because the page could link to itself. But we know that the Bs are all positive, right? So in particular, this, they're all positive, and this is just, right, this is just a row of BT being summed, except the term in the diagonal. Same thing as summing the column of B. It needs to sum to one, but I'm not counting BKK, so this needs to be one minus BKK, right? So we get, in particular, that you know, lambda minus BKK needs to be smaller or equal than BKK, and this implies that it's to be at most one. Oh, one minus, sorry, one minus, of course. Right. right, this is either if PKK is zero, it's inside a disk of radius one. If PKK is a bit forward, it's inside a little sphere, uh, right? So if you think of this as zero and this is one, right? If PKK is zero, it needs to be inside a circle like this. If PKK is somewhere over here, right, it needs to be in a smaller circle like this or like this, right? So, but all of them are inside this big one, so this must be zero. Okay, so what did we learn? We basically proved this theorem, right? That it is, uh, I mean, we didn't prove that it's unique, right? To prove that it's one of the largest eigenvalues, and it is an eigenvalue. So at least I can define the scores this way. Now, there may be different ways of defining them, right? There may be different values of x that still satisfy this, okay? 